Adora. You've come at last. Finally, can you give us some answers, please? Thankfully, we have Light Hope who shows up here, who finally gets the ball rolling on answering a couple of our questions here. Lost could have used someone like this. But first, we shoot back to Glimmer and Bo, who are, of course, wondering where Adora could be. And for some reason, Angelia didn't force her daughter to lay in a bed or at least fetch a doctor just in case. I mean, she's still glitching. What if she's just turning glitches and then calls off balance and cocks her head on something? Ow! What kind of monster put the chair here? It's your room, Glimmer. There really isn't anything they can't do. Adora never explained where exactly she was going. So they're stuck just sitting here until some magical solution can, can crop up. There's... Uh, something here to see you. I would like to point out that Swiftwin somehow managed to convince this guard to take him up to Glimmer's room, and at no point did any other guards or, say, staff question it. Also, I want to get this out of the way. I do not hate Swiftwin's character, I just feel extremely indifferent about him, so that's why I will have little to say about him. Just know it's just not because I hate him. I think Adora needs our help. Since Adora transformed me, I've been able to feel where she is at all times. Does this count as a deus ex machina? I think it does. On the one hand, it's a solution handed to them out of the flu and with an ability that was never really established? Because they have no other way to help find Adora. But it is magic we're talking about. It, it really doesn't bother me that much. It's an easy solution that was handed to them. I'm just not being critical of it. So now, Glimmer is about to run with the help Adora. Now that it's confirmed that she does need help. And now we transition back to her and Angela. What are you doing here? Coming to see why my guard was escorting a horse into your room. You seem to be the only one who wondered about that. Where episode 10 was them finally communicating to learn what their issues truly revolved around, which was an inability to properly communicate and Angela's fear about getting another family member killed because she ordered the battle that got Micah killed and let the alliance fall apart after the fact. This time it's about rectifying the issue, or at least getting started to. Angela more than knows by now it's pointless to try and stop her daughter from just running out to save Fedora, and holding her back kind of flies in the face of what Angela said back in episode 10 for Glimmer to be stronger than she once was. I told you I regretted giving up after your father died. I will not consign you to the same regrets. Angela knows the feeling of loss and not being able to do anything about it. And even though her daughter is glitching out like this, she does let her leave with Bo and the recently uncovered talking horse. It's dangerous and risky on her part. And after some triumphant music, Angela looks after them and says, And please be careful. Here, I see this scene as her trying to loosen up and accept that this is what her daughter does and holding her back is pointless. It's best to just let her go. Let her get out there. Let her do something. Glimmer has done a fine job as a commander for now, and letting her go out to Gallivant in the woods looking for something is not something these two are unfamiliar with. It's a step, and one Angela is ready to take to try and get past her overriding fear of losing someone again. You got my note. The one you dropped on my head from the air vent. And Trapdoor will always be the most endearing character for me, right next to Scorpia. Mostly because of how eccentric she is. Like, she could have just called out to catch her, but apparently she took the time to write a note, then just drop it from the vents. Then just went running around taking things from various rooms, grabbing stuff to analyze the data crystal. Where did all of this come from? Oh, here and there. Rooms. Yeah, Entraptor Strip just stole all this stuff. Glad you know the same as me. I say steal, but Entraptor herself doesn't seem to grasp that idea and tosses that all out the moment she starts talking about the crystal. Now, I really like the next scene because we jump back and forth between Entraptor explaining the first ones and what they did to Etheria and Light Hope doing much the same, but also with the addition of She-Ra. I love how the writers managed to make this exchange work right without it just feeling like two different exposition dumps. We get the first ones being called Explorers and their technology being interconnected throughout the planet in a balance with the rune stones for each princesses. And they are important nodes in the network. Light Hope explains how the Horde's war of threatens to destabilize things. And in Traptor goes off talking about how using a rune stone can hack all these interconnected systems to empower one of them. And we learn that She-Ra is a line of warriors who kind of just passes down this sword through person after person. And Light Hope explains that they're supposed to keep balance on Etheria. 
and I really like how they give you this information. Cats are barely understanding anything and just egging and trapped on to better explain it. In Adora, we finally getting her to ask some questions about She-Ra, coupled into it, while Adora remains true to her original goal, which is learning how to heal Glimmer. This back and forth between these two different scenes allows them to advance side by side when giving the audience information, to where it would have had characters repeating themselves, and one of these scenes would have ended up coming across as a mostly pointless exposition dump. You like the Black Garnet? Because <laughs> we have the Black Garnet. And of course, Katra is all for the hacking the Black Garnet idea to make it more powerful because it's an opportunity to assist in something impressive and of course just mess with Shadow Weaver. Shadow Weaver won't like it. So, I will absolutely get you the Black Garnet. Light Help, well, she's a computer program and definitely behaves like one. But one thing I want to focus on is this. I watched you grow up from afar. Something about last episode was the fact that Adora and Katra were scanned by this place, then it started showing events of their past that ended up driving a wedge firmly between them, and Light Hope admitted to have been quote-unquote watching Adora since she was an infant. So here's a thought you might not have realized before. Light Hope intentionally showed things that would break these two apart. I mean, it seems awfully convenient they happen to be scanned and then the right memories show up to get Katra into thinking Adora never saw her as a friend and betrayed her promise. But the Horde is destroying us in their quest for power. The images shown by Light Hope here while she's explaining the Horde causing imbalance can be ones just taken from Adora's mind. Plus, she said stuff that Raz did too that spurred on Adora into taking up the sword, that Etheria needs to protect her from the Horde who's trashing the place, and now Light Hope just happens to be here speaking about Adora being a part of some grand line of Shira's whose destiny it was to bring balance to Etheria, all could be an attempt to have Adora think of events in a certain way. It's a real hard hero's journey talk here. Wow, what a nice shot! I like how awkwardly it's angled and excessively zoomed in it is! Combine that with what Light Hope says when Adora insists on helping Glimmer her friend, she explains Mara. We of course heard about Mara back in Ep3 with Raz, and now we get from Light Hope that because of attachment she became unhinged and it trapped Etheria in some pocket dimension. Then shows images of Glimmer and Bo in danger and in Trapta, one of the reasons Adora feels like a failure because she thinks improper planning led to Entrapta's death. And tries to explain that Adora's presence alone endangers everyone. It is as you said, your friends are endangered by your presence. But how would Light Hope know all of this if not for the fact that she scanned both she and Katra's mind? And I mean, she controls this whole place, which means those holograms in the last episode wasn't just random, but purposefully made to drive Katra and her apart by Light Hope. Possibly as a way to make Adora emotionally vulnerable. Because she wants Adora to detach herself from Etheria and just stay at the Crystal Castle and do what Light Hope wants. She took Adora and suddenly exploited her insecurities to try and get her to stay and be nothing but She-Ra. I really like this idea of Light Hope trying to manipulate Adora and Katra's fractured friendship into breaking, then strip away any attachments to Etheria Adora has. I think this is especially true after what we learned about Light Hope's purpose in Season 4. And this could have been the first indication that Light Hope is shady and a sort of subversion of the mentor character. Something observant viewers can connect the dots on, but casual viewers could miss it without them, you know, losing out on a serious plot detail. I, I really think this is true. I really think this is what happened. It almost works too. But then Glimmer, Bo, and Swift Wind, who was able to open the door in here somehow, was able to bust in and get her out of here. Mostly Swift Wind talks her out of it because she didn't really hurt anyone. Bo and Glimmer are here to save her. Bo and Glimmer are risking their lives, but because you're their friend. And Adora comes to realize, destiny or not, she made this decision to be a hero to help people. That was her decision and she wants to stick to it. It's a great moment where Adora acknowledges that blaming herself for failure won't help anyone, though it's a shame she doesn't really grow from it like back in Ep 4, where she came to a realization that the power she wields is mighty, but coming short shouldn't cause her to just give up. She will grapple more with this idea of, you know, screwing up, bumping into problems, and then completely bashing herself to the ground with a self-made cludge. 
but that's for later. All right, hurry it up. Those machines aren't going to hook up themselves. Finally, we get the moment where Catra finally shows her adoptive mother why she was wrong to scuff her for Adora. They won't be hooked up at all. Shadow Weaver finds them fiddling around with her source of power, and of course she doesn't like that. Oh, Shadow Weaver, I can do whatever I want with this hunk of rock. But Catra finally stands her ground firmly, not being intimidated into submission like times before. I won't count this as a reckless moment because Catra has Hordak's permission. She has every right to think she holds all the cards here, and Shadow Weaver's outburst and attack was completely unexpected. Will not take what is mine! This whole exchange between them is golden. It goes to show just how little Shadow Weaver has noticed Catra's skill or cleverness. Catra ducks and dodges, rightly knowing she cannot win a frontal attack, and verbally shooting back to throw her off. You thought you were punishing me all these years? Wrong. You were training me for this day! Ah! Catra has already perfectly identified that one weak spot in Shadow Weaver, likely long ago, and with one strike, takes her down for good. That was such a short exchange of blows, but it reaffirms that Catra was not some meek person like Shadow Weaver believed she was. Come back. Come back to me. Come back to me. I have to say, I really enjoyed watching Shadow Weaver just scramble on the floor like this. And that smugness with Catra is so well deserved, I can almost forget Catra is still our antagonist. Shadow Weaver could have had two perfectly good wards, but I suspect her favoritism towards Adora only encouraged Catra's failing traits to get out, and it was her inability or unwillingness to see Catra's better sides that led to her ultimate downfall through just underestimating her. Is that ironic? The Black Garnet gets hacked, and Etheria loses that balance that was established to be very important, and suffers some kind of, I don't really know what to call this disaster, I'm not looking it up. But it's time for Catra to rise here, and while I don't fully enjoy her continued fall into a villain, it's so well written, I can't help but quietly root for Catra in the background. And I mean, that's how you know someone has written a really good villain for their story. When you start having this like, don't like relationship with them. That was episode 12 of Overanalyzing Shira. If you like this video and want to see more, then hit that thumbs up and the subscribe button, then bell to get notifications about the next episode. I'll try to update this series every Thursday, so please share with other fans and also check out my channel for my video essays, music analysis videos, and complex character series. You might find them enjoyable as well.